Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lisa Small. I'm the Senior Curator of European Art at the museum, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's exciting program. Before introducing the program, I just want to extend a special thank you to all of our Brooklyn Museum members who are attending this afternoon. Your support means so much to all of us, and it helps make programs like this possible. So if you're not already a member and you're interested in becoming one uh, and enjoying perks such as free tickets to the O'Keefe exhibition and invitations to members-only mornings, please visit the membership desk in the lobby. I also want to encourage you to return on Thursday, March 30th at 7 p.m. for another fascinating program, rapid fire lectures and a round table discussion called Deconstructing the Artist's Persona. It will be led by Jennifer Blessing, the Senior Curator of Photography at the Guggenheim, and she'll be joined by other art historians to examine the construction of the artist's persona. Participants there will include Joanna Burton on Cindy Sherman, Tirza Latimer on Claude Cahoon, Richard Meyer on Andy Warhol, Adriana Zavala on Frida Kahlo, and our good friend Wanda Korn on Georgia O'Keeffe. And of course, Wanda Korn is here with us today. An esteemed scholar of late 19th and early 20th century American art and photography, Korn taught art history for almost 30 years at Stanford University. She is the author of numerous books, including the award-winning study of avant-garde modernist culture called The Great American Thing, Modern Art and American Identity, 1915 to 1935. She has also been an active guest curator, having recently organized the exhibition and written the accompanying book for Seeing Gertrude Stein, Five Stories, which was on view in 2011 to 2012 at the National Portrait Gallery in DC and the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. It has been my great, great pleasure to work closely with Wanda to organize the Brooklyn Museum's presentation of Georgia O'Keeffe, Living Modern, which is the beautiful result of years of her thorough and groundbreaking scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Wanda Korn. One of the appendixes to the book that I've written to accompany this exhibition, you will find the, uh, a list, best as I could pull together, of all the photographers for whom Georgia O'Keeffe sat. Um, and I'm up to somewhere between 40 to 50, I didn't recount. Uh, but that's an amazing record for any living artist or yeah, an artist of the 20th century. And I probably can say without um, any uh, uh, problems, without any con contestation, that she probably is the most photographed modern artist from this country in the 20th century, or certainly the most photographed women uh, modern artists. And you know, if you've seen the exhibition, that her... Life as a model began just about the same time as her life as an artist, because she was the lover and then the wife uh, of Alfred Stieglitz in New York, who was a great photographer. And he took it upon himself to create what he called a continuing portrait, uh, and made his first pictures when he first met her in 1917, and his last pictures 20 years later. And he photographed her on an annual basis. And that so-called continuous portrait it numbers something like 330 uh, photographs, formal photographs, staged and beautifully composed photographs. What happened then is a very interesting story. He sort of had a monopoly on her during their years together. But once he stopped photographing her, then other photographers came uh, knowing what a great model she was. Let me just get out of your way here. And I'm giving you just a couple of examples that are in the show. Ansel Adams, for instance, and Philip Halsman, or a little bit later in the game, Laura Gilpin, and then Bruce Weber, who I think probably gets the honor of the last photograph taken of her where she dressed for the occasion and clearly was posed and staged against a piece of her um, sculpture. So what we have going today, which is so thrilling, is sort of helping to fill in the pieces, the post-Stieglitz pieces um, of O'Keeffe as a model. And what we're going to do is we have four people who had a, a variety of experiences working with Miss O'Keeffe, and we're going to take them one by one, and I will have a conversation with them. And hopefully at the end, if you have questions, we'll keep them till the end, uh, you can um, talk to each of our, our guests um, as well. 
I should tell you that um, the, the man in the picture is Juan Hamilton. You'll be meeting him in a couple of other places during our afternoon. And you learned how he came around to ask her whether he could help her in any way, do chores or whatever. And eventually he moved into becoming uh, her assistant. And uh, he, he did everything from record keeping to giving, helping her with her daily schedule. Um, but she had macular degeneration in the 70s. And maybe Perry, you can mention this because I'm always amazed how sure-footed she looks in your picture, but in fact, she wasn't seeing that well, but she always seemed to be looking directly at you and walking as a, a woman with purpose. She walked every day, but tell us a little bit about interviewing her. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, I really, I uh, didn't have the f feeling, though I know that's the word interview, uh, that I was that I was interviewing uh, Georgia. Uh, it really was a question of uh, having done uh, a lot of research and uh, having had the luck to have the uh, the counsel of Lloyd Goodrich, who was the uh, the head of the uh, Whitney Museum at that at that point. And he was warning me about who to interview and not to interview, because if you interviewed a certain person, uh, George O'Keefe would not talk to you. And uh, of course, of course, uh, if you if you've seen the film and you read about know about George O'Keefe, uh, you know of course that it was Dorothy Norman. And uh, but Dorothy Norman uh, owned a lot of the material uh, on Stieglitz, which this is a little, some years later, but uh, talking to Georgia, uh, the question is, what is Georgia like? People ask me, and I say, if you've seen the film, uh, that's what she's like. She's c completely relaxed. She's uh, very, she'll either, uh, once she had agreed, to do the film. And uh, I started talking before uh, about it. Uh, the question is, uh, why, why did she say yes at that, at that point? It's a question of timing. I think in life that uh, timing is of the essence. I mean, for example, uh, those of you who are uh, married or have a very intense, uh, long-lasting relationship, you know that if you had met that person five or 10 years earlier, you would have had nothing to do with each other. Uh, and this is, uh, the timing was right. For one thing, her age, she was 88 at this time. And the fact was that uh, Juan Hamilton uh, had become, uh, they become uh, very uh, useful and very important to her. And they became uh, uh, quite close and Hamilton felt, look, George is 88. Uh, if there's going to be a film done, it better be done now, you know, not to, not to wait. And um, fortunately, he also was enthusiastic about, uh, about the, the uh, uh, George, uh, Gertrude Stein film and whatever else he knew about. Uh, so, but I did get recommendations from some people who were important to her, including James Johnson Sweeney and uh, Lloyd Goodrich, et cetera. Uh, but also, it was the letter. And what did I say in that letter that I worked for weeks on? I said, in essence, people have written and written and talked about, uh, about your pictures and why you do them and, or, and about you. We would like to hear your voice. What is it that you would like to say? And, uh, uh, and that seemed to work. She, they understood, she understood that she was going to be able to uh, express the way she felt from her own point of view. In any case, she finally said, okay, uh, agreed, 
that I uh, can come and visit her. And uh, uh, as I had told you, uh, NET was willing to uh, cover my expenses. And uh, when I first, uh, when I first got there, when I first entered, I have to admit, I was really very, very, very nervous and uh, very insecure about how this was going to go uh, and intimidated because Georgia had a rather intimidating uh, uh, reputation as far as if she didn't like something or somebody, you know, she didn't make any uh, pretense. And uh, so uh, I was going, I was on a vacation actually uh, with my husband and uh, managed to work it out so that uh, the end of the vacation, we ended uh, in Santa Fe and uh, I was a little embarrassed because as a woman uh, producer, uh, if I was a male producer, would I have my wife with me? Uh, in any case, if we were out in Santa Fe and we were going to see George O'Keefe, uh, I certainly was going to bring my husband along. And it turned out very well because he, uh, the builder, and she was so proud of her house, she kept talking about the four-foot walls these in Abiquiu, she had two houses. One, uh, as you may have seen in the film, uh, Ghost, Ghost Ranch, Ghost Ranch uh, and this other house in Abiquiu. Uh, and that's one of the exciting things about the exhibition is uh, the things, the original things in the house, beside her clothes and uh, uh, all the furnishings and the, the way she lived, the whole idea of living modern uh, is in the exhibition, which of course you either have seen or will see. And, uh, uh, and when she came, she said, shook hands, and she said to him, we have such warm hands. And she looked at me and she said, you don't look like a producer. <laughs> and I thought that was a good sign. Very, very, and this is exactly what she looked like at the time, because you have that wonderful picture with her. Let me ask you one other question, and then we're going to need to move on, Perry. But I wondered, did you ever get any sense from her after seeing the film what she thought? And did, had she asked you to see it when it was in rough cut? Or did she give you complete liberty to go forward? It was, it was a rule that we never showed a rough cut to anybody in any of our films. It was an absolute rule. But I did have an understanding with her and with uh, uh, Juan. Juan that I would send them, I would send him uh, a copy of all the transcripts, which are invaluable, and now they're at the uh, George O'Keefe Research and Wanda Korn has first access to the most incredible, because if you know, when you do a film, you use maybe five minutes out of the hour of talking. And if you've done, obviously we use more than five minutes with Georgia, but the fact is that there are pages and pages of marvelous stuff that we just couldn't use. And I started with a 90-minute film, and it had to be cut down. Uh, in any case, uh, I think that there are other people who have to talk. So, uh, <laughs> well, we uh, before we give her a round of applause, I want to say that I had one privileged moment with Georgia O'Keeffe in 1980. So I was seeing her a little bit after this film had come out, and I'd had the benefit of seeing it. And I, too, was intimidated. Um, so intimidated that I didn't even ask if I could have a picture with her. I, I'm really envious that you got that one picture with her because I felt that might just close the interview right down. But I, I think you had the same experience I did in speaking with her. When you ask her a question, just as you, she, you've oh, seen yes, here, see. she just has she has kind of a beginning, middle, and end to her answer. They don't wander. They're like little um, nuggets that she gives you, and it, it's with a spareness, I would say that is typical of what we're demonstrating up in the exhibition. But she did like it, I didn't really answer. She did like the film because she asked me uh, to do a film a couple of years later, just a few years later, on Alfred Stieglitz. 
And if she didn't like it, she <laughs> would not have asked me to do oh, the other I didn't, film. I didn't know that connection. That's very nice. And you, by the way, can get these films on Netflix, I think. Can you get them on Netflix? What? Can These films are rentable, are they not? Well, Alfred Stieglitz uh, is actually, and uh, uh, Georgia, uh, we were able to raise the money for the Stieglitz film because the film that I had shot in 1980 turned out that I not only had an old print, but the original negatives were still at the lab. I mean, it was, and it was 25 years later. So this is one of those miraculous things. And once you could say that you had this marvelous material, uh, original uh, interviews with O'Keefe, then it was possible and uh, not easy, but not too difficult to raise the money for the Stieglitz film. No. Anyway, I recommend them to you. The Stieglitz film is called Alfred Stieglitz, a... The Eloquent Eye. An elegant, eloquent. The Eloquent Eye. The Eloquent Eye. I, yes, and I'm very, great. very sorry to say that after uh, selling, uh, I guess, like, I don't know, two million copies or whatever they sold of George O'Keefe, it's impossible to buy a film, uh, the original George O'Keefe film. But I would say that uh, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of libraries yes. have copies. I'd be very surprised, and lots, lots and lots of schools have it. I'd be very surprised if that you would not find uh, uh, a copy to borrow from a library. Thank you so much, Perry. I was going to recommend your libraries. Okay, my, um, I'm not being able to advance. No, that's too much, isn't it? There we go, there he is, sorry. There we go, all right. Tony, you're up, but let me say a word about you. Um, Tony Vaccaro is well represented in the exhibition upstairs. You will see some of those images as we um, talk, but you, just to give you one that I'm sure you've not missed, if you've been upstairs, when she's looking through the Swiss cheese with the big hole, <laughs> she's looking right into the camera of this gentleman to my um, <laughs> left. Uh, he is a very celebrated American uh, photographer, and is, when he speaks, you'll hear that he has deep Italian family roots. Um, and his work has been uh, exhibited and published in many, so many articles, uh, and a number of books have been dedicated to his work um, that are notable. His career and public notice began when he was a very young soldier in the American Army during the last two years of World War II, um, and he stayed on after the war and took a number of pictures in the European theater uh, and in Germany uh, after uh, the, the uh, fighting had ended. He went on to become a fashion and lifestyle photographer for magazines such as Life and for Look, uh, and he had you name a few celebrities, uh, Sophia Loren or uh, Jack Kennedy, um, Fellini, Picasso. In fact, I think we see him behind one of his images of Picasso here, uh, and so on. Georgia, for him, was an assignment, um, although he got some of the most unusual photographs of her uh, on that assignment. So I'm going to ask um, Tony to speak with you, but before he does, I want to tell you how I came to know Tony before I came to really know Tony, which, which was today. But I had this dress in mind, which is on the left, and you know that there's a, a wrap dress over another white wrap dress upstairs, just like this. It's something she wore for 25 years for many photographers that came to visit her um, in New Mexico. And I had to figure out where those dresses started. Tony, I hand you this honor. You are the first photographer she ever wore that dress for. And she must have liked your photographs so much because they translated, particularly that dress outfit translates very well in black and white film, um, that she never stopped wearing it for photographers who trekked her way ever since. So that's my first introduction to Tony, was to give him the Wrap Dress Award. Um, and I, I'm going to have him... <laughs> I'm going to have him tell you about the visit, but he, that, the award he also gets is for patience. 
um, and for cleverness because he had to, um, he, he spent many days on, on assignment. He had, if I can just say it really quickly, he had an assignment from Look Magazine with the art editor, whose name was um, Charlotte uh, Willard, uh, and she was going to do, and this is 1960, something that was really very um, unusual. She was going to do an article on women artists. And she wanted pictures of each of her five or six women artists that were at work seen with a work of art. And they had to be in color. And if you know anything about Miss O'Keefe, you know her preference was for black and white because that's the way she had started her life as a model um, and so on. She was, uh, she was uh, according to Miss O'Keefe, she told uh, Charlotte Willard to go find uh, a, photo, photo, a photograph that was ready-made and use it for the purpose. But that wasn't what she couldn't find a ready-made for what she wanted. So she brought Tony along. Am I got this right? Okay. So when um, Charlotte and Tony arrive, she's, shall we say annoyed or surprised or what would you say? But anyway, she wasn't expecting a photographer and she wasn't sure she was going to cooperate. So that's where I'm going to have you start the story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am very pleased to be here to speak about Georgia. Uh, I went there with the idea of taking some unusual pictures of her different from other photographers. Um, one way to do this was to get to know her very well. We walked and walked and walked before I took the first picture. Uh, after a while, I realized uh, what a magnificent person she was. Uh, I was, uh, at the beginning of my career, a gardener. I had a farm in Italy before I was born in America. But I have a farm in Italy that I still love. And it was through this idea of uh, showing her how it was to plant things and see things growing. And sure enough, two, three days later, she arrives with cans, empty cans that she fills with dirt and start planting. I have it on the screen. Here, there, here it is, yes. Uh, this idea came from what I told her. Uh, at the beginning, she was annoyed with me, but eventually she really literally grabbed me in such a way, the conversation that we were having, that uh, the editor that had come there with me got up and says, I don't belong here, and left. And so I remain with George O'Keefe for maybe two more weeks, and we did uh, all, I'm sure, pictures that you're going to see. We had breakfast together, we had breakfast, lunch, dinner, we talked about uh, how to make the best salads, the best spaghetti, the best linguine. Uh, she wanted to know all of these sauces that you see there. There's three different sauces that I made her taste. Uh, <laughs> Shall we go look at the next one here? This is one of your playful ones that we all remember. Yes. How did this come about? Uh, and where are you, in the front this, seat? Uh, this, <laughs> came, uh, this came about uh, one day when she said, let's go for a picnic in the desert. We arrived at that desert, and it was uh, the location where the Indian who airs uh, on a nickel, or yeah. uh, the, she wanted to meet the family of, the, of that uh, 
Indian. The nickel, the, I don't that know, they make jewelry out of the Indian on nickels, I know. Yes, yes, yes. So she wanted to meet these people. And we went there this particular day. When we arrived, you can see the background there. It's a little blurred. Uh, we couldn't go out because it was raining. So we had our picnic. You see there's a, a glass of wine there and Swiss cheese with a hole in it. And while I am cutting something else, I turn around and there she's looked at me through this cheese. <laughs> so by the time we arrived, this was a rainy day, uh, beginning to rain. And uh, the conversation went on to many people. She was interested uh, in the greatest the bullfighter of Spain that I photographed. Oh, what was it? Do you have his name there? Uh, no, I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. Manolete. Manolete was unique uh, in the bull ring. He had such class, and she knew all about Manolete. Uh, uh, she had never seen him, but uh, I showed her the pictures of Manolete, and uh, and we became. A closer friends. So how many days are you spending photographing her? And I, want, I ask this question because she wears that dress every day. So I cannot count yes. different outfits. So I think... Uh, we spent together, I would say, 15 days. 15 days. It's quite yes. amazing, um, the, the adventures they had together. And this is one which uh, he hasn't looked at for a long time. It's not in the exhibition. But if I have this right, that's, it's also a wonderful picture for me because it shows me what the back of that dress looked like. <laughs> But I, and you notice she often wears it with gloves, and in several of Tony's photographs upstairs, she has gloves on, and we just saw some gloves in Perry's film, I noticed. Yeah. She liked to keep clean. It was very dusty. That also helps explain her use of scarves and hats, was partially not just to look the part of her surrounds, but also um, to keep the dust and dryness out of, out of her hair. But I asked Tony if this isn't a setup, because if you see it the way I see it, it looks like, looks like she's holding up her ghost ranch house. You see that? You know how people will often do that with the uh, oh, Washington Monument? They'll hold their hand out in such a way so it looks like it's growing out of their hand. But you don't remember that, she or do you? She was telling me about the mountains in the background. Uh -huh. We were, because of the color that those mountains uh, had. Uh, there are hills, really. The Pedernal. Yeah. We yeah. will see a little bit later on, and yes. also Malcolm's. Uh, well, you finally got the picture you were after, the yes. picture that was going to go for the article. But that's like several days in, isn't it? Several days so in, So let's yes. just tell, the, tell that story. First of all, we're going to show you, uh, it was Miss Willard's idea, the editor's idea, that it would be a studio picture. And what she didn't know is that Oh, so it was like this is the Abiquiu studio, and she's moving. You can see the gorgeous view she had. In this case, it's a view of a, a river valley, the Chamo River Valley from this house. All those lovely cliffs and so on are out at Ghost Ranch, two quite different terrains. But what, uh, sh what um, the editor did not know is that O'Keefe never allowed herself to be seen painting, except in one instance that Perry used, that Ansel caught her. But uh, she was not... I'm sure Tony had to cajole her to get her even near one of her paintings. She used very few paintings to decorate her home. So I think his award-winning picture, which is this one, there we go, um, in color, I've never seen, I've seen versions of this in color, but I haven't seen her posing for you in color in any other venue than this. The reason this picture is this way is that I, I had visualized the picture, her world and nature. Why did she go in this desert, to live in this desert? And the reason I left all this room is that I wanted the story on her 
printed over this terrain, you see. But uh, eventually, when Luke went to do the story, they cut at the elbow, and the, all of this was away. But the story that I wanted, I wanted to be done on this picture. Well, you'll be glad to know in my book, I wanted it too. So this is the picture we have in the book. This is the <laughs> we, we restored have. that right yes. panel. Uh, I had seen uh, her work in the gallery of her husband. I, uh, I had seen the new pictures that she had posed for her husband. Uh, I wanted none of that. I wanted class, because that's, to me, this picture is class. And, and that's what it is. The picture is cut at the end of the elbow, and so you don't see this at all. Uh, as for in my life, uh, it's one of the moments that I cherish the most, mm -hmm. the time I spend with George O'Keefe. That's so nice, and I have read that in an interview that you have uh, given, that you didn't see her again until 1970 at the Whitney Show, which we're gonna talk about in a second. The catalog for the Whitney Show is right down there. Um, and that she was, of course, surrounded by people. This was a big, big opening in retrospective, yes. and she caught out and of her eye. And then she caught my eye. She sees me. And she had enough of those people, you know. She came to me, puts her arm around me, and said, Tony, let's go look at our picture. She didn't say my picture, this picture. Our picture, that was wonderful. And that was this painting, I presume, yes, right? That yes, was in, the in the back, there was a... Yeah, at the a, Whitney. This at the was Whitney. at the Whit. Took place at the Whitney yeah. Museum. Well, that is just a, a charming story. And when we asked Tony to pick out some of his favorite pictures, he came up with two. I want to show you that I don't believe have ever been published. I certainly have never seen them, and I'd like to think I've seen most of what's out there. But here's one of them, which is a very beautiful color shot. Did she mm, resist color film with you at all? Because you did many black and whites uh, and just a few colors. I didn't tell her you didn't when tell I her. was doing color what I was doing <laughs> black and white. That's probably a very good idea. Yes. But this is a very, very handsome uh, picture. And then this one is very unusual, and I bet there's a story, which is this one. This, uh, it was spring, as you can see, all over. Uh, and I wanted to give the world uh, this ethereal quality that she had through a photograph. Uh, and, and this says it. For me, it says it. She is one of those flowers. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. Thank you, Tony. That's a You're great welcome. way to end. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn uh, to Malcolm Varen's work. And he has a very different story and set of experiences. Uh, his métier as a photographer is to make beautiful reproductions of paintings, sculptures, decorative ob objects. He's made a career of doing the kind of work that you see in beautiful art books. Uh, and rarely get, does the photographer get enough credit for um, the hours spent lighting and photographing those paintings that, of course, are the work of somebody else. Well, that's how he and um, Georgia O'Keeffe met. His first assignment is the book that you see on the left here, and it's that size. And that was for the first really major catalog, museum catalog, on her work. 1970, I certainly remember it, it opened in, at the Whitney Museum. I had never known any, I, I knew her name, but I didn't really know what 
her life's work looked like. I can remember that show vividly. I was in graduate school here in New York. And that show went on to Chicago and then to San Francisco. And so it was momentous for her because it was a national event. Um, she'd had smaller museum shows, but nothing quite of this uh, stature. And he was hired, I'll let him tell the story himself, to do the um, image that's on the cover, but also to do some of the images, the color images. There are only a few colored images in that book, which is why she wanted to, in part, write another book. Um, because she really did not have a book that was totally in color. It wasn't quite yet possible without a lot of money being spent for an all-color production. So in 1976, she did the book on the left, which is the paper version. I'm not sure, that may be the hardback, but one, this is the original size and heft of that book. It's lost its cover, but I can barely pick it up, it's so big. Uh, and the notable feature of this book was, A, she was its author, there's a running text, but also, um, uh, she didn't want to be broadcast as so much as the author. She wanted her paintings to be the gist of the book, the heart of the book. And it is the first publication that used only color for the reproductions of her art. Uh, and Tony took a lot of those particular pictures. And then he went on to become kind of the court can we call you the court photographer whenever anybody had an O'Keeffe that needed to be photographed for, for um, re reproduction, um, whether as a print or in a book, um, Malcolm's, Malcolm became the go-to guy for this. And he has something, uh, is it 600 photographs or something like that in the catalog raisonné. This is the two volume um, recording uh, archive of every work that we know of O'Keeffe um, and its whereabouts and its provenance and so on. And he worked, he worked very hard, I think, on that, um, on that production. Uh, and it's where he and I met, I think, for the first time, was around that. So, Malcolm, I'm gonna let you tell. I have asked Malcolm to talk a little bit about his photographs of place. He also has a few of, uh, of Miss O'Keefe later on, but we haven't heard much about the houses we've seen um, details of it, but this is, as he will tell you, the way you get to see her if you went to Abiquiu. This is where Perry, we all have visited there. You drive through the gateway uh, into this kind of parking lot, dirt park, parking lot, with her house there to the left. So Malcolm, maybe, I, I, I suppose it's a useless question to ask you how many times you have seen Miss O'Keefe or been with Miss O'Keefe, but because it's many, right? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I've spent six weeks in Abiquiu, photographing for that book. And um, we had lunch every day also. And she was, uh, she had, she lived in a, she lived in a, Abiquiu is a town that's populated only by descendants of the original uh, Spanish settlers that's, that uh, came here from Spain. They had land grants from the King of Spain. So all the people in this village, except for O'Keefe, are descendants of those people. And so we, um, we had lunch every day. She employed the people in that village, and so there was a woman who cooked dinner there, cooked lunch and dinner, even though O'Keefe herself was a cook. So I have these pictures to show you kind of the ambiance and the, um, the atmosphere in which these photographs of O'Keefe were taken. The, uh, I'll just go uh, to another picture here. Uh, this, is, this is a shed inside of her house. And if you've been through the exhibition, there's a photograph by Karsh, which shows her in, uh, in uh, um, profile, sitting right underneath that, uh, that set of antlers. And it's, uh, it's in black and white. Well, this is the actual shed. And uh, O'Keefe was very particular about how things looked in her house. She was very simple in her taste in that respect. But everything here was placed in exactly the way she wanted it, including the cords of wood that you see on the right. Now, there's some discrepancy here whether that door is actually the black door. She painted a lot of paintings called the black door. And behind that black door were, is where she kept all of her paintings. And this is a courtyard in the house. This house is built around the courtyard. It's all built of adobe. 
And that, to my best recollection anyway, is where she kept the paintings. And so I took a picture of that. This, this circular thing in the middle is a, is a well which is not used anymore. It's a defunct well. Now, I put this doorway in, not so much because it's some great architecture or uh, even maybe even a great, not a great photograph, but I put this store in because when you walk through O'Keeffe's house, you walk through a bunch of passageways like this. It was a very simple house. It was all adobe. The floors were adobe. The walls were adobe. The benches were adobe. And, and there, was no, there, there was no ostentation in this house at all. It was extremely simple. And you can see here, in this little passageway between the rooms, she has a, uh, uh, a hose hanging up on the wall and rakes and brooms and things. The reason I put this in here is that on one of the next pictures, I'll show you uh, where this leads to where I shot uh, O'Keefe sitting on a bench, although you can't see the bench, on an adobe bench. Oh, by the way, I put this picture in, again, not because I wanted to show a great picture of her kitchen, but because it shows you how simple she lived. She, she had enough wealth, she was very wealthy. Uh, this, these pictures were taken in about 1970, between 1973 and 75. She lived extremely simply. There's no, none of, no expensive gadgetry in her kitchen. It was a very simple life, although she could have afforded the most ostentatious kitchen you can imagine. Can I talk about the table in that oh, regard? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yes. So she designed a table because she couldn't find what she wanted for either of her two kitchens. Uh, or for her dining room. And because she was frustrated in finding anything that was sort of out there, either an antique or a, a current uh, piece, she designed this, designed, I'm putting that in quotation marks, I think, this simple table which she had her um, helpers make. It's basically two sawhorses and then a uh, veneered, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Plywood, thank you, thank you. Um, plywood top, and she liked it because she could take it apart and, and people could then sweep or clean up afterwards. But also in her dining room, if she didn't want to have a table, she wanted an empty room for the occasions, the whole thing could be broken up very easily. These are very simple tables and some people find them a little, um, uh, which I call raw for the setting. <laughs> but she was very proud of this, uh, design and told people about it. And she also had those tables at Ghost Ranch as well. Yes, she also had both houses, too. yeah. Now, the way this picture came about was I was photographing the uh, paintings for that book in 1975. It was just before O'Keeffe's 90th birthday. And um, someone, a, a writer from Art News, Mary Lynn Cotts, was in, San, in, the, oh, in Abiquiu uh, interviewing O'Keefe and wanted some uh, pictures of O'Keefe at that age, and O'Keefe had none. And so I offered to, on speculation, photograph O'Keefe um, and then uh, charge no fee unless they actually used them in the magazine. And so O'Keefe agreed to that, and so did uh, Mary Lynn Cotts. And uh, for two days, I walked around Ghost Ranch and Abiquiu photographing her with Juan Hamilton, who's not in these pictures but he was also in the entourage. Um, and so this picture is taken in Ghost Ranch with these uh, cliffs in the background, which she made a lot of paintings incorporating those cliffs. And that waterfall that you saw in, in one of uh, uh, the pictures before is somewhere along that row of uh, cliffs. And, and of course, she's wearing this, uh, this dress with, with this, uh, that's a calder. Uh, the Calder pin. The Calder, the, yeah. right. And then this, the Aguiar belt. Right, exactly. Now this is a tree, I think this is a tree she painted, and I forget what the name of the tree is, but this is also on Ghost Ranch. And I thought it would be interesting to photograph her in one of the trees that she painted. And so I did. Uh, and, and by the way, you see her with a cane. Now, I, I spent a lot of time with O'Keefe, and I saw her walk around without using a cane. She was capable of walking without a cane. So I asked her one day why she had that cane. 
And her answer was that when she walked out in the desert, she needed a cane to shoo away the rattlesnakes. <laughs> and, and there were a lot of rattlesnakes there, I can tell you that, because I killed one while I was there, who almost bit me when I was walking around the compound. She told me the same thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, there you, now you've got cooperation. It's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I took this picture of her because, you know, O'Keefe, when you were with her, you never saw her as an old person, and you saw her as a very gentle person. And she was also relatively short, actually. But this picture, she could have this appearance of being extremely regal, almost imperious. And I saw that and I shot that. And that's, that's what I saw when I took this picture. And this, and this hat, by the way, is a, is, is a gaucho hat. It's upstairs in the exhibition also. This is a hat she wore all the time. And it's actually a gaucho hat, a, a, an Argentinian horseman's hat. Now. This is in Abiquiu, and she's, you can't see it here, but she's sitting on a, a bench, which is also made of adobe. Everything was made of adobe here. And the interesting thing about being in O'Keeffe's house in Abiquiu is that she's surrounded by this very ancient architecture. And one day, I was walking through that passageway that I showed you before, and I was walking to my studio, which went through this room, uh, to get to my studio. When I was walking through that passageway, in this adobe setting, I hear Wanda Landowski playing the well-tempered clavier, coming from, I don't know where, it sounded like it was just coming from the sky, and it was filling the whole house with this music. And I thought to myself, this is it's strange and startling to hear one of the one of the most beautiful things ever written in uh, the modern era in a place that, that is totally ancient in its aura, which is the adobe setting. Anyway, so I decided to take a picture of O'Keefe in that room, and, and I took it so that you could see. When, you look, when O'Keefe looked at you, it was an intense look. You, you felt that she was looking into you, through you, beyond you, and could see everything about you, including all the things you didn't want anybody to know. <laughs> and, 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 and the witness to that is this pelvis bone in the background, like, like a ghostly figure witnessing like a, like, a, like a Greek chorus what was going on. Anyway, that's, that's how that picture got taken. Now, that's the paternal in the background. That, that's a, and, 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 and in O'Keeffe's pictures, in the paintings of the paternal, she always paints it blue and out of focus, which is actually how it looks in real life. There's always, it's so far away, this is Ghost Ranch. It's looking out from Ghost Ranch. And it's so far away that the blue haze uh, in the sky causes it to look blue. And so I thought I would take, uh, make kind of what I thought would be an iconic image of O'Keeffe, just her face and her profile, together with an icon which she created in her paintings, which was the Paternal Mountain. And that... This is my choice for the ending of <laughs> these uh, pictures. O'Keeffe didn't smile a lot. <laughs> but, uh, but Vaughn Hamilton, who uh, you may or may not know who he is, and I won't even go into that because this is not the place to talk about that, but he, he was a companion of O'Keeffe and was a very important figure in her life. And he was really the only person that I ever saw that could make her laugh. And, and Juan was here doing all these photographs at present and was, I don't know what he did to get this reaction, but she's laughing very heartily in this picture and so I shot it. I think that's it. Then. <laughs> so, Malcolm, you know, we probably should tell our, our listeners the story of the Pedernal is that she liked to say, and maybe she says it in Perry's film, I'm not sure, does she say something like, um, I thought if I painted that mountain, 
uh, enough times God would give it to me. <laughs> uh, and it was a, it's, a, it's a familiar motif. It's sort of like Saint Victoire was uh, the mountain of uh, south of France that, that Cezanne painted so often. And the same was true of this mountain and its special relationship to to her um, art. I want to also say that Malcolm tells me that there is a book forthcoming published by the University of New Mexico Press that will be these kinds of pictures, right, a collection of them. And they're not as well known because uh, in a certain way uh, he had an assignment or two, but he was working very hard on the reproduction. So it's going to be exciting to see them. And there are a couple of pictures upstairs in the exhibition that Malcolm has also loaned for um, this show. So let's go then to our final speaker. Um, and I'm showing you two things. I think I'm showing you. Yes, here we go. Um, two paintings, a painting and a small Polaroid that is upstairs in the exhibition, at the very end of the exhibition. Uh, it is a portrait that Andy Warhol did of um, Georgia O'Keeffe. And he based it on uh, a Polaroid, much like the one that you see here, having made a whole series of Polaroids of her in 1980. And I think for our audience, it's a surprise to learn that she and um, Juan Hamilton visited with uh, Andy Warhol, I think from my research, three times, once in Ghost Ranch and then twice uh, at Warhol's uh, studio and the, the factory. Um, where, and in those two times that he, they were there, um, they were photographed. The first, the Polaroid shots of, um, of uh, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe that Andy himself took, and then the gentleman to my left, Christopher Makos, was there for a second, uh, a second uh, visit. This one's very late in her life, in 1983. Um, and there was a very specific um, purpose for this visit. Andy Warhol had a magazine called Interview. The interview, I believe, still exists and is still being published, is yes, it not? Yes, it does. Yes. Uh -huh. And he wanted to do an interview, but needed a f and also wanted a photographer on hand so that this interview could be published, which is what you see both on behind me, but we also have a copy upstairs uh, on view. Christopher Makos, a New York photographer based here, um, is very well known for his pictures of artists and uh, musicians. Uh, and he has some interesting things to tell us about what was an exclusive visit, if I've got this right. Um, he was called in, uh, in, or he was with Andy at the time when this interview took place. So while um, Andy did the talking, did you do the photographs? I'm not no, quite sure uh, what came uh, first. I just want to. You had said a lot about this um, photo session, and actually there's a few things I want to correct okay. about it, uh, which um, uh, this actually, this wasn't done at the factory, this was done uptown. And also, um, it, from my perspective, uh, just so your audience knows, I was part of the Warhol factory from 1976 to 1986. So uh, my sort of metier in my world uh, unlike this esteemed group here who spent days and weeks with George O'Keefe, my time could be spent in, with hours. So I only spent a few hours. So I'm, I'm the newbie in this group of <laughs> esteemed people here who have spent a lot of time with her. But uh, for me, it was the quality of time that we spent, not the quantity. And um, another correction here. Although the beginning of this uh, showed off Interview Magazine and the portrait that I did of her and Juan Hamilton, uh, who was at the time, both Andy and I think George O'Keefe were trying to promote Juan as a potter, but much more sort of like an artist potter. And um, so the other alternative reason, uh, I think, the main reason that you see here is this photo session and interview for Interview Magazine. From what I, my recollection of the story was that Andy and George O'Keefe were going to exchange paintings in the way that artists often do. You know, I'll, you can have one of my paintings, I can have one of your paintings. That was my recollection. And the second benefit from this story and this idea was, well, we'll do an interview with you and put you in Interview Magazine. So I don't want to correct you're part of the story, but from my perspective, that's the story that I knew. Uh, so the swap didn't ever happen? Pardon? The swap 
never happened. Uh, it didn't. No, it didn't happen. Andy was very disappointed about it. But, um, and also to, t to t further tell you about this, uh, I actually went up to the Upper East Side, and I don't remember exactly where it was. I think it was the hotel that they were staying. And the reason why I say that, because I can see on the left of George O'Keefe's outfit, it looks like one of those fancy uptown chairs. We didn't have chairs like that at the factory. Uh, so um, I was there to photograph George O'Keefe, frankly. I didn't know who Juan Hamilton was. I was always naive at all these photo shoots. Andy would say, Chris, let's go up and do this. Uh, here's this. And I kind of would try to do my research, but I was too busy with something else or something. So I would just go along and then I'd say, wow, just like this time here, these, these people are unbelievable. This gentleman next to me, Tony, he told me stories backstage about World War II and, I mean, his stuff. They should, we should leave the stage and just let him talk. <laughs> and also, Perry over there, she's got some stories that are unbelievable. But I'm so humbled by their presence. But the, the real story is that, um, and Juan, I mean, look at, look at the facial expression in Juan's face. He is very suspicious, like, what are you doing? Well, what I'm doing is I'm cutting you out of the picture. <laughs> okay, because uh, I didn't want him in the picture. Okay, because uh, I wanted a portrait. Now, if you go to the next one. No, I think, I think we might have one more with one then. Well, here he is. Look at the expression. Like, are you, do you have me? I think he knew that I didn't want him, I didn't care about him in the picture. Because for me, he... Uh, he doesn't belong there. He doesn't really belong there. No, he doesn't belong there. So, so of course... And this is the picture that I got. And upstairs, you can see uh, my contact sheets were in the, uh, are in this show, and you can see me cropping him out wherever I can. <laughs> so, uh, so this is my portrait of her that I came away with. Um, and, and so that's kind of my story about how I met George O'Keefe, was trying to get her partner out of the picture. <laughs> can, I, can I ask, do you remember what time of the year this was? I'm, uh, this is another lead into a dress wow. question. You know, um, was it summer? Re somebody recently in my studio referred to the guy that runs my studio, uh, Peter Wise, who's my archivist. And when that question comes up, we're for in the room, he will just answer the question with the date. Because I live so much in the moment that all of this work is really, you know, my f uh, photographers, we, we really speak through our photographs. And we are often asked to come and talk about our photos which we do have stories, but they're not usually stories about our photos. They're stories about our experiences around the photos. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if we're successful at we do, our photographs speak for us. And so that's why I don't have that answer. So I call, I call my, we've been calling uh, Peter Wise Google because he, uh, somebody will just <laughs> say, when Google. did this happen or which time of the year? So Peter, I know you're here somewhere. Do you know? <laughs> I, and he asked me not to call him out, so I'm okay. not really calling him out. But if a voice in the darkness of the room out there <laughs> knows when this was done, would you say, yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. The reason I asked is yeah. she is wearing this black robe dress again, well, uh, but uh, customarily she did not wear that when she was on the road. She wore a black suit. For city, she used to call it her city clothes, and well, somehow. she's not wearing the white underneath. No, she's not. But she's got the two, the pin and the belt, a different belt in this case. This is another belt that she owns. Uh, uh, owned. She didn't have much jewelry, but this is one. Anyway, I just thought I am been proven wrong again, which is I think I might have said in the book that that dress was always worn when she was local in the Southwest and did not. And always we had to drag out the suits, and she sometimes complained about that when she went to New York. So you have a special photograph here from that perspective as well. Do you it want to? The oh. belt that she loved. Yes, that's well. This is not the Aguiar belt, but it's um, a belt that it, uh, she did pose in a couple of times. A little less than the number of times you got her. So do you want to look at the next one? Here we go. Oh yeah. Well, so this, this is good. These are uh, the pictures with Andy, and once again. 
I can really uh, uh, know that this wasn't done at the factory because to see the chair over here, this is like one of those uptown chairs in fancy hotels, you know, that we know. So this was Andy. I guess he was trying to laugh and giggle because he, he really wanted to get one of those paintings out of her. Because uh, that, that was the real goal here, folks. It wasn't, I mean, uh, I'm sure. So, so does he have a mic? Is he recording her at this uh, point? Is he interviewing I, I, no, her? No, he never had a mic, later? but he always had, he had tape recorders, you know, those little Sony yeah. tape recorders. And it was probably sitting on his lap there. But um, I have to tell you, uh, watching all these photographs that these wonderful people have of her and looking at the pictures of her in the desert, uh, and looking at my pictures of her wearing this simple black thing, I have to tell you, being as smart a woman as she was, uh, my guess is that she understood coming to New York City, it's about being chic and black. And putting a white thing underneath this wouldn't have been ish. And also, the way she wore that white robe with this black one was much more country. This is much more contemporary, much more chic New York, all in black with just accessorized with a little bit of, you know, excuse me, fancy jewelry, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's what that story is. And uh, the next one I think is the same pic sort of picture. Uh, there she is again with Andy's eyes shut. And these next series of pictures are to show you, uh, see this, this, uh, this is a $19 camera that Andy used. It was a Polaroid camera. See the little flash cube there? This happens to be Debbie Harry. And unlike the story that, uh, that was done at the factory, George, as you can see, the factory thing didn't have that kind of a look. And this is a portrait of Debbie Harry, uh, the uh, blondie fame. And this is Andy doing, th the way he did his portraits, back to the first thing, was with this very, like a $20 Polaroid camera. And the next picture, is um, it's the same camera with but a much more expensive flash on it. And this is Princess Caroline of Monaco. And then here's uh, Princess Caroline of Monaco looking. He didn't do this with Georgia. Um, he just did the uh, pictures at the studio. But uh, part of this story is actually Princess Caroline was asked by Vogue magazine to be the guest editor of Vogue magazine. And so... Um, uh, she was being an editor at this time, editing her pictures. And of course, this is the last series of pictures. And I'll point this up, which is really interesting. This is uh, uh, Basquiat, who I introduced Keith Haring to Andy and also Basquiat to Andy. But you see Andy's hands up here, they're up there. Andy, uh, if you know any of my work, whether it's uh, the alternate image series or any of the portraits that I did of Andy, his hands are always front and center. Well, because Andy was an artist, he, didn't, he never knew what to do with his hands. So he, in my pictures especially, he always did something with his hands. He didn't know how to pose. I often refer to people in Southern California, if any of you are ever out in Los Angeles and you're at a party or anything, Californians or people from Los Angeles, they always have set poses. They're always prepared to be in a selfie or to be in a picture and they always have a set pose. Andy really was the per precursor to that idea. He knew that if he, someone was gonna take his picture, part of his set pose was to put his hands somewhere in the photograph. So. I don't have as long a story because I only spent two hours, <laughs> unlike these people spent seven lucky, days lucky and weeks Lucky, lucky two hours. Days, so. But I have to say, let's go back to the picture that Andy did on the Polaroid. You were talking about how stylish she was, and I totally agree. But when he went home that night after making these Polaroids, he hadn't yet made the paintings. Uh, he wrote in his diary, um, O'Keefe seemed old to me this visit. She had some old black thing on her head, <laughs> which he liked well enough to make a very nice picture, and there are several of these. These are the diamond dust pictures where he had taken some glitter, that uh, diamond dust glitter, and would put it into the paint to, when it was still wet to give it a kind of shine. I'd, I'd like to add something to this, yes. though. If you know Warhol's portrait work, this is about as simple as it gets. There's no extra silk screens, there's no additional colors, there's nothing. I have a sense that because the portrait, the trade never came about, that he just did as little work as possible on this, 
this is my take on it. I, it's not a historical uh, context, but my personal take is I knew that Andy, if he felt like either, either he was betrayed or he didn't get what he wanted out of the, the art of the deal, um, <laughs> he didn't do much. And pr most of this was done by Rupert Smith, who basically was the person that did the diamond dust uh, idea. And this is a pretty, I have to say, from my opinion, lackluster portrait. Uh, it doesn't have very much going on. That's only my take. Thanks for your honesty. I think that's why we're all here, well, is to hear I from the- I only tell the truth about <laughs> right. this thing. That's great. Can we just have a round of applause for these wonderful folks? <laughs> It was a very, very um, enlightening and uh, ins inspiring uh, set of testimonies. And uh, we're very happy that we've put this on film or archiving it as a video, because I think these are important stories that we don't want to lose. Uh, now, we do have a few minutes with, that we could do questions for those of you that would like to uh, either ask a question or stand by and hear what more we might hear. But is there any, any questions out there that... Uh, yes, I see one in the middle. I guess, wait a minute, is there a mic here? Can you hear me? No. I'm going to borrow this microphone because it's being recorded. Okay, we need to get you on mic. So somebody's coming with a... Um, uh, I might say while we're getting the mics down here that um, I'm glad that you get to see a few of these um, photographs where uh, her twinkling eyes and s sort of imminent smile, and in the case of the one that we, we saw from Malcolm, hysterical laughter. She really was not uh, always in serious gravitas mode. <laughs> and it's nice that some of that's come out this afternoon. Well, no, that, there we go. That's Thank the, you. That's the perfect lead into my question because, because she did start out as a model. She did have some what I would call theatrical capability in her posing. And I wondered if you felt that bled into her friendliness with you all as photographers, or did you feel that you got the real deal? I will say, and as a lead-in to you, uh, if you respond to this, um, when I began to study who captured her uh, with a smile or a twinkle or looking through the cheese or so on, I began to see it was always photographers she knew something of, she'd come and she had good feelings for. She did not do that kind of pose really with uh, the in and out fashion photographers that came from New York to the same degree that she did with Tony um, or with Malcolm's. Well, he was just kept, kept lucky to capture, I think, her in total a laughter because she was known to tell other photographers, maybe you all got this too, don't shoot me smiling. Um, I learned from Stieglitz that that's vulgar. And then she even would qualify that and say, okay, but no teeth. Um, meaning if you could have a, a semi-smile, I don't know. Perry, did, did you get any admonitions as to whether she would smile for you or not? Did she, did she direct you at all as to what um, poses she was going to be in? Oh, you've lost your hair. Yeah. yeah, there we go. I mean, I guess the question is whether she, I see her twinkling eyes looking at you uh, in a couple was, of those cuts. There was a, a the thing with O'Keefe was that once she made up her mind, she was a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. She's very much like Charles Eames in that way, being very reluctant. And she had to be uh, persuaded to do the film. But once she made up her mind, she, it's, it was going to be the very best film possible. And she gave us everything. She gave us baby pictures, uh, home movies, home movies of her in Stieglitz, home movies of her up on, uh, up on the roof, things that I didn't know anything about, just started coming in, and uh, 
she, we were told, now look, Perry, you've got three days to shoot. You know, we don't want to exhaust her and uh, uh, overstay your welcome. And uh, well, uh, we had five days the first time and uh, she came to New York, we shot her again. But uh, she was determined that she was going to give the film everything that she could. And once she made up her mind, uh, I think she always felt that I, I talked too much. Well, of course, I, I, I probably did, I probably do. But uh, we never became friends, but she was very relaxed with me. And uh, we had, uh, of course, while I was there, uh, we had invited to lunch uh, every day. And, uh, and then on December 22nd, which was my birthday, it turned out that Warren Hamilton's birthday was on the 22nd. And another uh, uh, one of the friends of her group, the 22nd, and all of, a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden the three of us were having this big birthday party. She made a very nice party, and you know, they had cake, et cetera. So um, it was never a question of getting her to smile. I mean, if she talked about something that she thought was funny, she smiled. For example, uh, one of the, uh, do we have time now for a little, a little extra? Yeah, but we can't pull up any film if that's okay. what you're thinking. That would uh, be too hard. Uh, no. But she, um, uh, uh, was not very fond of the crowds of Stieglitz's relatives that she had to be with every summer uh, for decades up at, um, in Lake George. And one of the things, it's in the film as a matter of fact, she said, 20 people sitting around the table eating corn on the cob. <laughs> you know, this was, this was not, not her idea. She really loved to be alone, but with people. I mean, she had, had a lot of friends. I, she was not antisocial, but she needed to be alone. She needed what had become a cliche, her space, you know, and, uh, and Stieglitz needed people around all the time. Stieglitz absolutely had to have people, and uh, so I asked her once, uh, you know, uh, knowing they were so enormously different temperaments, how did they stay together, married, and from what I can see, in spite of, shall we say, marital, serious marital uh, involvement on his part with Dorothy Norman, uh, how did they stay together until he died? Why did you, uh, once she found that she adored and was so happy and worked so well uh, in Santa Fe, uh, why did you keep coming back to, to New York? And she looks at me as though it's, it's sort of a ridiculous question. She said, Stieglitz was there. You know, where else should I be? So uh, there really was a very profound connection and she talks a lot, of course, about the intense uh, uh, involvement and interest in each other's work. The work was very, very, her work was very important to him. His work was very important to her. And they had a similar world view. So uh, the fact is uh, that I think that she really, really loved each other uh, in spite of everything and some hard times in the marriage uh, un until the end. Yes. Do we have another question? We probably could keep uh, going. Could I one. add oh, something? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead, Tony, and then we'll take She detested to waste time. She would rather listen to Mozart, Vivaldi, than just do nothing or say nothing. Uh, I have her uh, in photographs going through discs of Mozart and Vivaldi especially. Uh, she loved uh, classical music, 
She was really a deep woman. Philosophy was at the tip of her brain. She just was interested in the world that we live in. This is the essence of George O'Keefe. She, she didn't want to spend one day doing nothing. She was, uh, when she came to New York to the exhibition where she had, at a certain point, uh, she got bored with everybody, came to me, grabbed me, and said, let's go and see our picture. She didn't say my picture, our picture. And it was the one uh, that I photographed where she was out, outdoors holding the painting. So there, there was this fantastic woman who got, got away from all those people, just the two of us, and go and see her painting. Yes, thank you. That's a wonderful, wonderful memory. And uh, you know what would back what backs you up entirely are there were two or three memoirs by late life caretakers uh, of O'Keefe that took, made diaries and sometimes drawings and so on about their days with her. And they would totally support the every day had to have a lot of activity and that activity was around music and having the caretaker read something to them. And she would direct the caretaker to go find that book um, the Japanese famous book on the Book of Tea. And then she'd say, I want chapter three read. She knew exactly which chapter. And once uh, a caretaker said, we both found it kind of hard to understand. And she said, let's read it again and see if we can understand it. She was much more of an intellectual than I think we give her credit for. And love, lover of music. She, now we Could yeah. I just yes. say? We got, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nike, and then I think we have a mic back here. Okay. Uh, this is for uh, Perry Miller Adado. I know that uh, Stieglitz, during his relationship with Dorothy Norman, took similar photographs of her that he took of uh, O'Keefe. And I'm wondering if you have. Uh, if Georgia discussed this at all, or if Dorothy Norman discussed this at all, and what their take was on this marriage with three people in it. <laughs> so the question, well, the question, I, I, I think the question was that, that um, about Dorothy Norman and the photographs that O'Keefe, uh, that, that were taken in very many of the same poses as early photographs of O'Keefe, yeah. I think it's, uh, uh, it's worth mentioning that when there was this uh, major exhibition of uh, not, not long ago, could be a few years ago, of uh, Alfred Stieglitz's work, that the Met was George O'Keefe was still alive oh. and not a single photograph uh, of, uh, of Dorothy. Dorothy Norman. Uh, not a single photograph that he made of her was allowed to be shown. Not one single one. <laughs> yeah, that was a show, I think, in the late 70s at the Met. Is that where you're thinking of the photographs? Well, she was still alive. Yeah, she was still alive. Well, she died in 86, so that would be the case. Yes. Do I have another? I see a hand here that, oh, yes, sir, please. And it's really amazing. I was just wondering how many photographs you took in the 15 days or so, and if you also took photographs when you saw Georgia at the Whitney Museum or that visit in, to New York. You mean of George O'Keefe? Yeah, mm -hmm. when, you, when you re saw her, when you saw her uh, the, the, in set at the Whitney, did you have your camera with you? No, I didn't have the camera with me, yeah. but I loved her. Yeah, is she I, in a gray I, 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 silk oh, yes, suit? Yes, black and white, yes. Yep, that's right. Yes. Okay, 
And if you have any idea, yes. how yeah, many, yeah, we have a how many yes, rolls I, of film I love in the way the she year. came to me and said, "Let's go and look at our picture." <laughs> <laughs> We're going to remember that for sure. <laughs> yes. Um, now let's. All right, use him. He's the pointer here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, everybody was wonderful. This was such an interesting session. Thank you very much. Um, did, didn't Ms. O'Keefe have artwork from other artists in her homes? And what are some of the other artists that she admired? I can answer that probably better than anyone because I've looked so hard at pho photographs, although Malcolm may have an uh, answer too. First of all, I, I did mention earlier, she did not like clutter and very few paintings uh, on the wall are what pleased her. She would occasionally put one of, or two of her own in her living space and maybe one or two in the studio, but it was not a place to go and, and sort of have a gallery filled with O'Keeffe experience. And that's the same a case for other things that she owned. She did own a few pieces by Arthur Dove um, and John Marin, uh, both of whom uh, Stieglitz uh, supported and showed very, very often. Uh, she had a little sculptor, sculpture by La Chaise. And uh, at some point she acquired a Calder, um, the Calder Mobile, that you see in some of the pictures uh, on the monitor upstairs. But very, very few people, um, and it was not what she would call a collection, but rather mementos of artists she admired. Uh, and for a while, uh, I've seen descriptions that her living with the only, uh, oh, she also had a couple of African masks. I should say that too. Um, that were very precious to her and sometimes were on her walls. But uh, she did have a little Arthur Dove in the living room for a very long time and a lot of people commented on it because it was odd to have just one artist and one painting from those many artists that she had spent time with. Well, she did have Stieglitz photographs, but she did not put them on the walls, no. That's an interesting question because uh, I'm not sure that she um, would have known that uh, light is photography's enemy uh, and kept them off the walls for that reason. But no, she did not have any photographs by anyone on her walls, but she did have some in her archives. Sure. Here we got it. Thank you, too, to all of you. Malcolm, could you talk a little bit about photographing the paintings? Well, um, in particular, what would you like to hear? <laughs> Well, I first started uh, photographing O'Keeffe. Um, um, the first thing I actually photographed of hers was on the cover of that book, when uh, Doris Bree, her agent, called me to sort of give me a test, which I didn't realize I was being tested, but she called me to photograph an O'Keeffe, and I went up and photographed it. Uh, she thought it was one of the best reproductions of an O'Keeffe she'd ever seen, and immediately, we went out, a week later, we went out to Abiquiu <clears throat> and uh, photographed that painting, which O'Keeffe had recently finished and which was hanging in the back of her two-car garage in Abiquiu. We went out there at night. It was a rainy night. I photographed it. I set up my lights, uh, photographed it, and stayed overnight uh, in, uh, in Abiquiu. Ever since then, and ever since then, um, O'Keeffe hired me to photograph paintings that were going to be reproduced in her books, which is how I came to photograph the paintings in that big book, which was her first book of, uh, the first book ever published of her paintings. And, and those are all my photographs, uh, and which is why I was out there in 1975 uh, photographing. That book was published in 1976. Um, I guess, does that answer the question? <laughs> so, Malcolm, I have an add-on question to um, the one you've just gotten from Linda. 
uh, in the bit that we saw from Perry's film, she says something, she's looking at a color proof, and she says, the colors don't have to be absolutely like they are in the painting, as long as they feel right on the page. So I've had many people find this a curious thing to have said, that she wasn't going after accuracy so much as she was going after the right feel. That's true. That, that is what she said. And I agree with that. Um, you, one of the things that I became expert at was to get accurate color to match paintings. However, the more, in, in seeing thousands of thousands of paintings that I've gotten very close to, including Rembrandt's and, and the most famous paintings anybody has ever seen. I've seen them up close and I've photographed them. And what I can say is that it's true that the, that the, the feel of the painting is what you come away with. The accuracy of the color, not so much. And when you're talking about color, it's the way colors relate to each other in a painting that are really what you come away with. So if the, if the colors themselves are not totally accurate, if they relate to each other in a way which the painter intended them to, then you're getting the feel of what the painter wanted to express. So I think that O'Keefe was right about that. And even though she herself uh, went over the, those, by the way, in Perry Miller's Adato's film, she's holding up my transparencies and looking at them. Um, she, uh, even though she was very um, adamant about getting accurate color, ne nevertheless, the, the final test was whether it looked right in terms of the overall feel of the painting. And I agree with that in terms of many art books that I've seen where my photographs are published where some of the, some of the reproductions were not entirely accurate in terms of color, but they actually felt like what the painting uh, how, they felt like, like what you got from the painting when you looked at it in person. Good. Who has a mic? Do you have a mic? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, did you want to say something? All right, go no, ahead. Perry. I just... Uh, I, I there, just, we need a mic over here. Since, uh, since Malcolm is uh, talking about uh, the photographs of the paintings in the book, uh, before I came... Uh, the first day uh, to uh, actually in Abiquiu, uh, I really did not have a clear idea of what the structure of the film was going to be. I had enormous numbers of wonderful interviews with her, interviews with pe people who were close to her, but then I come into that room and there she is sitting uh, uh, at the table, looking at the pictures, and uh, 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 Juan is sort of in the background, uh, whatever else they're doing uh, in connection with the book, and there it was, the structure of my film uh, with Georgia talking, holding the pictures up, dis discussing them, and then cutting away to, of course, I had. Uh, I think it's important to mention that uh, uh, days and weeks and weeks of research so that you know what questions you come prepared uh, with the questions. Uh, but you have to have luck in everything, but especially it seems in filmmaking, because the structure of my film was given to me, and every time it seemed to be the right moment, to come back to uh, uh, Georgia, working on the book, uh, gave you exactly the kind of uh, rhythm and the kind of a uh, of, uh, film that, uh, that I was able to make eventually. Great. Now, there's been much talk about the black dress. D uh, did George O'Keefe make that dress? And if not, do we know um, who did make her clothing? Um, yes. Uh, some of the clothes upstairs, particularly the early pieces uh, of white, of the two-piece white outfits that, that open the exhibition, and uh, two or three of the black outfits in the next one, and then the three beautiful blouses, I do attribute to her hand. However, once she had enough money to 
hire seamstresses or tailors, um, she used them and uh, only used her own skills, which were considerable as a seamstress, to darn and to mend. She was a hand worker. She did not do machine work, best we can tell. Um, nobody seems to remember a sewing machine in the household. But she did, and we even have some of her tools upstairs uh, um, in the um, exhibition. The wrap dress story is a late life story. It starts because of Tony's pictures. I can say it starts about 1960 when he made his visit, though she may have acquired the first of those costumes uh, earlier. She had over 26 of them in her closet when she died. In most colors, soft colors, but m many in black and uh, several in white. And the story is that the first two or three of them were off the rack from Neiman Marcus. Um, they had started life as a coat dress that was really a, what they called a model's cloak. And models were uh, preparing to go on the runway, had uh, worn that either over their clothes to keep while they did their makeup and their, their hair to keep the clothes uh, clean, or even uh, wore it uh, while they did their um, preparations and then put the clothes on uh, afterwards. And anyway, it started as a model's coat, although it has an earlier history of Claire Ma in Claire McArdle's um, wardrobe and designs. Um, but Claire McArdle started the idea of being able to wear such a simple dress out of the house, not a house dress, but something that you could wear out in the public, um, in public sphere. Um, but what uh, really sold O'Keefe on this was it's, uh, the Neiman Marcus version was much more basic. It was cotton, no lining, uh, it was, um, it's, you, you need seven yards of fabric to make one, cut on the bias. And uh, she um, loved the simplicity of it because it had no attachments. It really was like a kimono. She could put it on with one side down and the other side over, uh, not having to make buttons or um, hook and eyes or anything of that sort uh, to keep it all together. That was the job of the belt. Uh, so when she discovered how good she looked in photographs, uh, she somehow, whether it was a long-term sol uh, solution or not, all I can say is that she never gave it up as a basic costume when photographers c came. She I just loved black yeah. and white. Yeah, <laughs> she did. Simple. And she came up with that combination of wearing the black over the white. If you look upstairs, you'll see that she often would put fake white collars under her black dress and at yes. her cuffs to make it look like she was layering and had a white garment on there. But in fact, it was all, again, um, a, 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 very self-consciously done because she loved that combination and she loved it particularly um, when she could be dressed up uh, and have both white and black in the equation, if you can put it that way. The last room of the exhibit, which is called the Celebrity Gallery, is all about her late life clothes for the last 20 years of her life, um, where it's if she's going out on the road, she leaves, except for the time that Chris got her, um, she leaves the black dresses behind as, the, as a... Um, as Southwestern wear, and she pick up, as I said, the suits. And she's, we make the point in the show that she moves first from plain trousers, then she goes to a matching dress and jacket. The first suit that we show is a Balenciaga that she probably bought in the 50s, maybe in Spain. Um, and then she used New York tailors for those more tailored clothes. For the dress, she used local seamstresses uh, in Santa Fe, and I interviewed two of them who sewed and could tell me exactly how, as somebody said, the perfectionist, it was Perry, that how uh, once she had decided that that was her dress for keeps, uh, she took her oldest version, took it all apart, took all the, had somebody take all the seams apart, and then made butcher block um, patterns from the cloth. We have that taken apart. Uh, I know where it is, uh, piece. And then the um, seamstresses that she hired uh, would use that pattern to, to make the same dress over and over again. And Neiman Marcus was getting no credit whatsoever at that point. <laughs> Last question here. Uh, this is a question for Malcolm. I saw one of your books where you went out 
there and took pictures of the mountains that were from, that she had used in her paintings. And there were some 200, I think, pictures or something in that, in that book. And um, I'm wondering, did she take you out and walk around with you and show you where she uh, stood with her easel and, and painted from life of those cliffs and mountains and shadows and all that? Or did you take the picture of the painting and walk around and look for where she had stood? How did that work out? Well, uh, the book was published long after she died. And, um, and I took those photographs also long after she died. The book was, um, was written by Barbara Lyons, who's a, an O'Keeffe scholar, who was also the chief curator at the uh, O'Keeffe Museum. And what they did was uh, they gave me uh, Xeroxes of the paintings that they wanted to show the actual, um, they wanted to show the actual landscape that O'Keeffe did in the paintings. And so I had those Xeroxes with me uh, and I went out, and go, this is all around Ghost Ranch, and I went out there and looked for those exact images and found them, including an exact tree. And by the way, the humidity is so low in the northern New Mexico desert that it seems that nothing ever deteriorates there. It also seems that hardly anything grows there. And so there was a mountain that O'Keeffe uh, painted where, which had some pinion trees, little clumps of green pinion trees on the mountain, and had an old wreck of a, of a carriage somewhere below. And when I went out there, this was like 70 years later, and found that mountain, the same pinion trees were there, and they may have grown an inch, but they were tiny and they were in the same place, which is how I recognized that I was looking at the same mountain, with that, that uh, piece of destroyed carriage or something that was at the bottom of the mountain. And so, uh, in answer to the question, no, she was long dead by the time I went out and did those pictures, but, um, but I had Xeroxes, and that's how I found the, uh, the places. And it's amazing. By the way, uh, the other thing in photographing so many O'Keeffe paintings, uh, O'Keeffe had, at least I had been told, that O'Keeffe was an abstract painter. And I guess she's considered a modern abstract painter. But when you look at O'Keeffe paintings and you look at what she's painting, she was extremely literal in what she painted, and which is how I was able to find the images which she painted, because they looked like her paintings. And um, so that was kind of a revelation for me as well, to actually see that in person. Yeah, I had exactly the same experience when I started to be um, looking closely at her paintings. In New Mexico, I grew up in an era that was all about the New York paintings, not the New Mexico paintings. But there's been a kind of uh, shift now where I think we, we, we better understand that she had 40 years after Stieglitz in New Mexico, not to mention the 13 summers or something that she had gone out there. So that's a very important chapter. But I too was very surprised at how site specific her works are. She doesn't necessarily paint them, she does sketches, pencil sketches. And the easel does not go outdoors. Tony's one of the two people that got her to take that easel out of doors. And I think the second one was Arnold Newman. And I think he knew about it because he knew Tony had gotten her to take that easel out of doors. But I don't know how he did that. Because that easel belongs in the studio at Ghost Ranch, that white easel. It's there today. Um, she did paint out of doors, sometimes on her lap. Or you saw the one picture in Perry's film where Ansel Adams got her painting in a car. Um, but she, it was not, uh, like, like it wasn't uh, as important to her as it was for the Impressionists to always paint sur le motif, you know, at, at the site. Um, but she did start with something, and even at the end when she, uh, she gets a camera or two as gifts, including Polaroids, we have some Polaroids upstairs, she began to see that that's quicker than making a sketch. Uh, we don't know how much those Polaroids were used um, but as memory aids, perhaps. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it is amazing, the fact, what sets her off is something that she sees um, in front of her. Uh, and she, I can tell Malcolm, I'm sure this is the case, sometimes it's not easy to find those motifs, because she does not take the 
part of the landscape that sort of says, aren't I beautiful, aren't I dramatic, and so on. You have to move over a little bit to find one of her waterfalls or one of her white place um, uh, stone pillars, for instance, to get exactly right. She doesn't always have uh, at all what I call the wow factor in her choice. She makes it wow, but it comes to her as a set of forms that seem very promising, and they aren't necessarily the most beautiful part of the uh, landscape. You know, I'm going to end with a quote because we've talked, all of us, about uh, her nature, her, um, the importance of nature to her, um, and uh, the degree to which being out of doors in that environment was what drove her as an artist and in, uh, finally as a, as a person. And she once said something, and I think this is one part of her character. She said, if only people were like trees, I'd love them more. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, we'll say thank you for coming and being a part of this, and thank you to our guests.